It's a great pleasure for me to have here the uh, keynote. It doesn't require much traveling for me because it's, you know, our uh, own uh, building. And I will be talking about open science and the role of repositories. And before I uh, jump into the structure of the talk, I would uh, briefly um, define a few terms, uh, one of which is open science and the other one is research data. And as to open science, um, I always refer to the definition of the OECD. And this is the only slide with a lot of text, so relax. Um, uh, but I want to have one formal complete definition for open science. And um, uh, the o OECD um, says that open science refers to an approach um, uh, which provides greater access to research data. So this is number one importance of research data, enabled by ICT tools and platforms to which open access repositories belong, and a broader collaboration in science. Thirdly, including the participation of non-scientists, this refers to the concept of citizen science, which I will not be addressing during the course of my talk. And finally, the use of alternative copyright tools. This also relates to your activities because you are a member of the open um, access uh, movement. So uh, during my talk, I will be uh, referring to research data, ICT tools, platforms, and uh, also um, alternative copyright tools. And the key um, for open science is not to like, promote openness for the sake of openness, but to increase credibility in science. That is the original motivation for open science. We want to increase the credibility of scientific work. And how we can achieve this? We can achieve this by opening not only our final results in open access repositories, but also earlier stages of the research process. For example, data gathering or the study design if we conduct studies. So it's for the sake of credibility why we are pushing um, open science. And the second term I want to introduce is research data, because here it says uh, open science is very much related to research data. And uh, research data in general is um, all data um, uh, that scientists have created or collated to conduct research projects. And many people, when they hear the term uh, research data, think of like numerical data, like measurement data, uh, like data about the air quality, water quality, or climate. Uh, data. But research data is also survey data. For example, in economics and uh, social sciences, we conduct many surveys, and the data we are collecting during the service is also considered to be research data. And now important for you, also digital or digitized papers. So all the content in your open access repositories are considered to be research data because it has been created or collated to conduct a research project. And even beyond that, beyond the paper, 3D objects of museums are also considered to be research data. Many museums are now um, uh, digitizing their objects to make them uh, like available, visible to, 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 to the world so that people don't have to go to the museum anymore. And these 3D objects are also parts or uh, components of research projects. So these are also considered to be research data. So within the European uh, open science movement, but also in the German movement, we have a very broad view and vision of what research data is. And now for the remainder of, of the talk, research data also refers to the content you are hosting in your open access repositories. Now the structure of the talk is as follows. I would like um, uh, to uh, show you what universities can do to uh, promote the open science movement. Then in a very short part, I will uh, be addressing what a nation can do. And here I refer to a few activities in Germany. And the third part is the part in which I will be addressing uh, what international communities can do. And in that part, I um, put the open science movement, the European open science cloud movement, in context of the COA activities, like, for example, your next generation repository report. Okay. Let's start with what universities can do to uh, um, promote and foster the open science movement. I checked um, uh, for open uh, policies in German universities. 
This is just the statistic of German universities. And we have about like 360 uh, um, uh, universities and also research organizations uh, which have an open access policy. A policy in which they uh, recommend their scientists, for example, to publish green or gold uh, open access. We have some 30 institutions which have an research data policy. A research data policy, for example, um, defines that um, each project which uh, uses research data should have a research data management plan. And this plan defines, for example, for how long you will save and store the data once the project has finished and how you store it, how you make it accessible and things like that. And then I tried to find uh, institutions having an open science policy. And frankly, I didn't find any. Um, here I just put five into the Excel, not to have zero. Uh, maybe there is one having an open science policy, but um, I even didn't find a place where I could look for um, open science policies of universities. So one recommendation to the universities is certainly is to develop your own um, open science policy. And what could such a policy address? Of course, it could position your institution for openness. So you could define your position, for example, um, for open access, that is clear, but also open source, open source software. For example, in computer science, my field, the um, um, question really often is, uh, if we are in projects, what is the license for the software we are developing? Is it a GNU license? Is it um, uh, like GNU? So there are various different variations of open licenses. So a university or a research institution could recommend um, uh, how uh, their staff should make um, uh, software accessible open. Open educational resources is another big, big movement here in Germany. So our, our Ministry for Science and Education has allocated 5 billion euros uh, to promote this movement, open educational resources, for example, in the universities. What is the license of my own lecture? The um, initiative for open science is fostering very much open peer review. So what is our position to open peer review uh, processes? And on the left-hand side, uh, you see the GoFair logo. I uh, do not talk too much about open data anymore because um, we have seen that uh, many people are reluctant to make their data available openly. So we talk about fair data, and I will come back to, to fair data in the um, second half of, of my talk. So that is... Um, um, these are just um, uh, ideas for what a, a policy could uh, contain, and I have more ideas, of course. Such a policy could make recommendations to the scientists what open science tools, platforms, and repositories they can use. For example, for data storing and sharing, we have many repositories available, Zenodo, Triad, Figshare. We have this kind of aggregator, um, Re3Data. That could be part of a recommendation. For the archiving, we are again in your world. We, we can um, recommend repositories, disciplinary open access repository or institutional open access repositories. We can make recommendations um, where you can get information about copyright licenses like uh, Sherpa Romeo. And the next two one I will investigate in further detail on the next slides. Um, we can support the scientists with uh, tools, uh, open science tools such as credit or the registered reports. And I will uh, um, explain these tools in further detail because I assume that you are, for example, uh, um, familiar with um, Open Door and uh, Sherpa Romeo and all these activities because that is part of your world. But maybe not so much with credit. So the credit system is a taxonomy for contributor roles. Again, the idea is to increase transparency in science. If we have publications these days, we have all the authors listed, maybe in alphabetical order, maybe the professor first, maybe the professor last, but you do not really see in which role did which author contribute to a specific publication. And the credit system um, defined a taxonomy which uh, identified different roles a scientist can have 
when it comes to um, uh, the publication of a paper. For example, the scientists could be uh, responsible for the funding acquisition. Then he is uh, mentioned, or she is mentioned um, with this role. I acquired the funding. Another person might be responsible for the methodology. Then this person is mentioned in this role. Another one maybe wrote up the draft of the paper, and yet another one, the final paper. So, and the, the idea comes from the movies. You know, at the end of a movie, you always have these long, long lists who was responsible for the makeup, who was responsible for the audio, who was is responsible for whatever. And this is exactly the same idea, to, again, to increase transparency, because normally all the 10 or 20 or three authors on a paper do not have the same role uh, in writing up the paper. This is an open science tool you or your colleagues can use. Another one is registered reports for open science. And the idea is uh, because a study is accepted in advance, the incentive for authors changes from producing the most beautiful story to the most accurate one. Again, the idea is um, uh, to be accurate, to be credible. And uh, the registered report um, uh, system is as follows. You submit your um, uh, scientific achievements very, very early. Not at the stage once your study and all the measurements have been uh, finalized, but in a very early stage, that is uh, if you conduct a study after you have designed the study. And then the design of the study goes in a peer review process. And when uh, the study got accepted there, at this level, you also get the final publication accepted. Because the idea is here uh, that the design of the study is the most important part of uh, like empirical research, for example. And once you know that my study, which has only been approved by its uh, design, um, it has been accepted, I can really write up the most accurate um, uh, paper, and I don't have to write up a paper which is often very much in a selling mode that uh, this is this great and that great and we have these extraordinary achievements and things like that. Of course there will be a second review just to check uh, the final version of the paper once you have conducted the study. I make available all the slides for you so you can uh, follow the links um, uh, after uh, uh, you have returned back home. So these are two um, uh, tools, um, of course um, there are plenty more, but these are tools which are not that much known, but which uh, nicely illustrate how we can increase transparency in research. A uh, policy could also um, address how a research institution wants to support early career scientists. Here are two uh, citations from early career scientists, um, and they say what would be a good balance between open science and having a career in academia. In my honest opinion, um, uh, it is a competitive disadvantage. Can you only afford open science when you are tenured? The second person says, why should I share my hard-won data with my rivals that presumably uh, compete with me for the next postdoc position? And the question here is, um, you know, the young researchers, they are still um, hired by uh, like science 1.0, very traditional measures, um, uh, and these measures normally are not compliant with our open science uh, policies. For example, open science uh, wants us to make available, accessible the research data, and many people in our surveys, they argued, yes, I uh, support the idea of uh, data sharing, if it is the data of the others. So they don't uh, very much like to make accessible their own data. Um, and here is the reason why. And if you look at hiring processes, and this is the um, list of indicators in psychology, at least here in Germany, we ask um, 1,500 uh, psychology researchers um, for the uh, indicators according to which uh, hiring committee selects the future professor. Number one is number of peer-reviewed publications. Number two is for fit of research profile to the hiring department and things like that. And they have 41 of these indicators. And number 41 is 
indicators of research transparency. So it's the most unimportant, unimportant um, uh, indicator um, in uh, hiring uh, processes, at least for the discipline of psychology. And I'm pretty sure it also applies to other uh, scientific disciplines as well. So we could appraise open science engagement of, of the researchers, and indeed we did in the open science um, uh, strategy of the state of Schleswig-Holstein, uh, where our office in Kiel is, we uh, um, expected the university to acknowledge open access publications during and for hiring uh, processes. So um, we want, or an open access poli or open science policy of universities can appraise open science engagement and also research transparency. They can, you know, um, acknowledge open access publications, open source software scientific wikis and blogs. For example, we run our own scientific wiki on, and blog on open science. But of course, we don't get any scientific credits for this blog because it's not measured in the current measure system in the scientific world. Now, the next level. I come from the universities and research institutions to what nations can do. And let's have a look at um, the situation in Germany when it comes to open science initiatives. On the left-hand side, uh, you see all the non-university research organizations with their own um, open science initiatives. For example, Fraunhofer has an um, uh, initiative called For Datis for Managing uh, Research Data. Uh, the Leibniz SEO Association has a similar initiative, Leibniz Data. Helmholtz even has a like, strategic open science office. Uh, Max Planck um, is one of the early movers in open access in, in Germany with their digital library. On the right-hand side, you have um, uh, initiatives at the state level. Here in Hamburg, we have an open science in initiative in um, Hessen. Uh, we have the research data infrastructure. In the south, you have e-science. And beyond the uh, state initiatives, of course, we also have these initiatives in the different um, uh, institutions. For example, in your world, uh, very well known is the BASE system from Bielefeld, the Econ Store system uh, um, managed by the group of Olaf or Archive, which is partly financed by German institutions. And what do they offer? So if we, I mean, try to, to um, like aggregate um, on what they offer to the scientific communities, this might be the outcome. Very important is legal support for the scientists, because often the scientists do not know under which license can I uh, um, uh, publish my uh, um, uh, scientific work. If I publish it with a publisher, do I still have an open access license for my work? But also, and maybe more important for the repository managers, um, we can offer legal support. For example, what is the deposit license um, I should have for hosting, like in EconStore, almost 160,000 full text papers? Another um, Offer is, um, this also um, is one of the recommendations uh, you have in your next generation report. How can we federate the research, the re repositories? How can we network the repositories and what networks actually do exist and how do they relate with one another? This is what I wanted to say to, to this slide. And um, uh, the key question is always when, what is missing? Um, uh, in the first part, the open science policy was missing. What is missing at the national level? In Germany, we have one contact point for open access. We have uh, here in Hamburg the contact point for open data, fair data. We have one contact point for open educational resources, and we have one contact point for the infrastructures. But we don't have a national open science coordination. So we have all these open activities in with, uh, covering different aspects of openness in science, but there is no single institution uh, kind of monitoring what is going on. And what could be uh, the role of such an uh, open science coordination office? First, it could have a monitoring function, monitoring what is going on in uh, in Germany, frankly, most of the initiatives I mentioned at the beginning, I know because we were either contacted to be a member 
of uh, the initi initiative or because somebody of the ZBW got an invitation to give a talk, but there is no systematic monitoring um, uh, currently in, in Germany to monitor uh, the open science development. Secondly, harmonizing. We have um, uh, in, in Germany like many um, open science uh, strategies or policies at the state level and also at the federal level. And they are not really harmonized with one another. So if you work for an institution like the ZBW, you get half of the funding from the federal government and the other half from the state of Hamburg and state of Schleswig-Holstein. Now my question is what open access policy should I follow? The one from the government in Berlin, the one from Hamburg or the Kiel um, uh, open access policy. So these are not harmonized and uh, some of them are also kind of um, going into different directions. And we don't have an institution uh, harmonizing these activities. And finally, cultural change. Um, at this level, we don't have a single um, point of uh, coordination towards a new digital culture. Um, uh, to give one example, digital culture also means to um, develop incentives for um, sharing research data because we are convinced that only the change takes place if the incentives are there. And now I come to the third part, and in this part I will um, put in context the European Open Science Cloud with the um, core activity, particularly the Next Generation Repository Report. And at the um, uh, European level, the, uh, the big hype super topic at the moment is European Open Science Cloud. If you go to the European Commission, everybody's talking about the European Open Science Cloud. That is the, the uh, big topic. And the European Open Science Cloud uh, wants to bring together current and future data infrastructures. And according to my introduction and definition of what research data is, this also affects you because in the open access repository, you also have research data and you are a research data infrastructure. So um, uh, what does it mean to bring together? Um, in the European Open Cl Science Cloud, we want to connect these data infrastructures. The next slide uh, illustrates that further. We want only data infrastructures which are trusted and open. Trusted means when I access a document or a data set from one of the repositories, I can be sure that it is of good quality. This means trusted and open means it should be you know, accessible, not um, hidden behind a license wall. We should have open and seamless services. Um, that is, um, we, we should offer services which are not only you know, um, tightly connected to a specific repository, but the idea is also that there is like a service platform. And the service platform offers services which can be used for uh, different various um, uh, data infrastructures. And finally, um, uh, it should be cross-disciplinary. Um, across disciplines. Uh, this is because in science we have the clear tendency that uh, scientific research questions are, are becoming more and more cross-disciplinary. For example, one of the research questions in our projects is um, to what extent does marine fishery impact on food security in 2050? To answer this uh, research question, you need data from uh, like FAOSTAT, uh, Food and Agriculture, you need data from uh, um, marine sciences, you need economic data, and you probably also need data from a scenario database. So from many different um, disciplines. And what does it now exactly mean to bring together? Here each of these um, circles represents a data infrastructure, and they are disconnected these days. So the data resides in silos. And Bringing together means linking them up with one another. So um, to make it simple, the European Open Science Cloud is just like the links between the repositories. Scientifically, this is not a challenge. Technically, it is. Because we need to uh, um, agree on common standards and common protocols and common authentication systems and things like that. So this is the European Open Science Cloud. 
at the very sh with a very short introduction. And now the question is, how does um, uh, the EOSC um, uh, relates to your next generation uh, repository report? And I, uh, I mean, the, the Open Science Cloud, Realizing European Open Science Cloud, I was one of the authors. This one I read carefully over the last days. I hope to identify commonalities and also differences between the two. Um, in your um, uh, Next Generation Repositories report, you defined um, four characteristics. The fourth one is still hidden. I will show it um, soon. Number one is it should be resource-centric, the uh, repository of the future. It should be networked and it should be machine-friendly. And of course, these characteristics very well match with the principles of the EOSC. For example, resource-centric refers to bringing together the infrastructures, which is one of the principles of the EOSC. The repositories um, of the future should be networked and cross-repository connections should be established. For the European Open Science, we require um, a, a infrastructure with, which connects different disciplines with one another so that we can do cross-disciplinary searches. And thirdly, um, machine friendliness is one of the principles of the next generation repositories. Um, and we require open and seamless services and under seamless services, we do not understand only machine friendliness, but also machine readability. So we expect the repositories to provide only data which is machine readability. And um, this um, uh, relates to uh, applying, for example, ontologies or systematic taxonomies. There are two characteristics which I have not found in the uh, um, uh, other uh, document, but they do not um, uh, contradict each other, they are maybe complementary. In uh, the next generation repository, you um, uh, define the characteristics that the um, um, uh, repository should be actively active in the sense that it actively notifies users or other systems of any changes in the system. In the European Open Science Cloud, we have not thought about this one, frankly. So it is not addressed in our report that the data infrastructures should, have, should take an active role. But the European Open Science uh, Cloud should be an ecosystem of trusted, of, uh, trusted um, uh, repositories and, uh, what, because uh, we want the scientists to be uh, um, uh, sure that whenever they access documents or they research data from one of the repositories in the Euro European Open Science Cloud, we can ensure high quality of the data. This, remains, uh, this means uh, trusted, and I haven't uh, found a similar characteristic in the next generation repository. What are the differences between the two? The, your report, um, even to me as a, a computer scientist, um, uh, was, um, has a very strong technical uh, uh, focus. It talks about standards, protocols, support behavior, like for example, um, uh, resource transfer, ex opposing activities. So I think you defined 10 or 11 different behaviors, 11, 11 different behaviors, and for each of the behaviors, you had a very nice use cases to, to show why is this uh, important. And then you go down to the level to make really very specific recommendations of standards and protocols um, the community should use to support this behavior. So it's very technical. The EOSC is not only a technical system. So what we have in mind goes beyond the technological solution. And this is shown on the left-hand side. That is a, a figure taken from the GoFair initiative, which is uh, one approach to implement the European Open Science Cloud. And of course, we have the technical implementation, which we call Go Build. But in the European Open Science Cloud, we also have in mind the cultural change. So how can we you know, um, change the culture towards a like digitization of science toward open science so that the um, uh, researchers, for example, uh, have enough incentives to share their data. A second pillar uh, refers to education and training uh, because uh, we thought there are far 
too few um, uh, like uh, repository managers around, too few data managers around. We have the scientists, but the scientists, they don't have a genuine interest, for example, to describe their resources with uh, like very uh, um, detailed metadata. And then often the like, um, documents are only with a very um, limited set of metadata or the research data has no metadata at all. And we, we identified um, that we need a education and training pillar to um, bring up more what we call data stewards um, uh, to the European scientific system. Do they, the two, COAR and EOSC, know each other? And frankly, um, even though there are many commonalities, I don't think that they know uh, much of each other. So in our report, there are zero mentions of COAR. In your report, there is no mention of uh, EOSC. And at least we have one mention of open access in our like 50 pages document. And you have one mention of uh, research data, so it's a tie. <laughs> so <laughs> we, are, um, we know not much about each other. Um, but um, we can learn from each other. And here is a recommendation to the European Open Science Movement, and the next slides address uh, recommendations to COA. Um, we uh, in the European Open Science Movement can learn a lot from COA because you have these aggregators. You have core, you have open air, which is, by the way, very prominent also in the open science uh, movement. You have base here in Germany, and uh, core aggregates uh, 130 million open access documents. So that is really a great achievement. In research data, when it comes to an aggregator, that is a system which harvests all the uh, data repositories, we have a B2 find at the European level that is hosted here in Hamburg and it um, aggregates uh, close to 700,000 data sets. So compared to core, or base has 60 million um, open access documents um, harvested. So that is really um, not much. So here I think you are well ahead um, on the technical level um, when it comes to the aggregation of these systems. So EOS can learn from you or you can bring in your uh, competence into the European Open Science Development. Recommendations to COA align with the EOSC because all the content you have is, in our notion, research data and enable the next generation repositories to become part of the EOSC. And now you are, will ask me, well, fine, nice, but how? How can we do that? And I will give you the answer on the next um, uh, slides. One implementation path towards the EOSC is the GoFair initiative. And GoFair is, uh, has the vision to develop the global internet of fair data and services, which provides a common environment for data-driven research and innovation around the world. This is important uh, to you because uh, CORE is not a European um, uh, movement, it's an international movement. This is why I have selected uh, GoFair. Um, and GoFair is an initiative which has been uh, um, kicked off by France, the Netherlands, and Germany. And the GoFair movement has now three offices. One is in Paris, one is in Leiden, Netherlands, and the German one is hosted here in Hamburg, and the colleagues are sitting there in the last row. Um, so if you want to talk to them after the presentation in the coffee break, they would be happy um, to uh, help you. And how can you join um, GoFair? First, you should at least uh, adhere to the FAIR principles. I again checked to what extent um, do the go FAIR principles uh, match with the core characteristics. FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. That is, whatever repository will be uh, part of the GoFair initiative, uh, their data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And findable um, matches with the networked um, uh, re, uh, characteristics of the um, uh, future repository of um, uh, QR. Accessibility um, uh, refers to the uh, research-centric attribute 
in a core. Interoperable, maybe, I'm not sure, active. Active is really something we had not in mind when we developed the idea of the European Open Science Cloud. But reusable in the GoFair initiative means data should be machine readable. And you require data to be machine friendly. So that is another match. Yeah, yeah. I still have four slides. So. And how can you join? In uh, GoFair, we have the concept of an implementation network. An implementation network um, will deliver implementation needs of their domains. For example, in your domain, you will deliver the implementation um, needs as uh, written up in uh, the uh, um, uh, report of the next generation repositories. So you could provide a component or a service to the Internet of Fair Data of Services, for example, by providing all the network of open access repositories which already exist. You do not necessarily have to be fair at 100% at the moment. Currently in the office we are working on metrics which help us and also you to decide to what extent is my data fair. There is not the uh, regulation I have fair data or I have unfair data. You might be 20% fair or 75% fair. What is important to us is that you uh, comply with our rules of engagement and these rules of engagement, uh, for example, require that you adhere to the fair principles. And for example, we don't want a vendor login because in the end we uh, support the open science movement. More information um, about this um, is on the web page, which um, uh, I have shown uh, like two slides ago. And you can also contact the International Go Fair office. We support you in um, how to set up an implementation network, how you can contribute to build the technology. Um, if uh, COA wants to engage in training and certification, we could also, of course, support you there. So this is how COA with the uh, on the basis of its next uh, generation repository report can become part of a European open science movement and beyond uh, on, uh, can become part of an international movement like the uh, GoFair initiative. So I'm at the end of my talk. In the first part I addressed what universities can do, offering open science tools, for example. In the second part um, I uh, talked about what nations can do. Um, I see a clear need for national coordination of open science activities. By the way, the Netherlands is the only and first country in Europe which, um, in, which installed such a national open science coordinator. And the third part addressed um, what international communities can do. And here I uh, um, introduced the Go Fair initiative and how COAR, based upon your report of the NGRs, can become part of the European science movement. That's what I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much for your attention.